are continuing our series on, um, uh, on looking at Old Testament characters, Old Testament heroes of our faith, and looking at their lives and studying um, truths about them and how they point to Jesus. And this morning, we're looking at several different characters. We're primarily focusing on a man by the name of Enoch. This, um, initially, we were supposed to be speaking on Noah this, this morning, but then when I was reading Scripture this week, realized there's such a great story in Genesis 5 that makes, uh, there's so much truth in there that we need to know that I didn't want to skip over that. So we're looking at a bunch of names. We're looking at a genealogy this morning, um, and we're looking at a bunch of names that most of us cannot pronounce. Mo- um, many of these names are irrelevant to us, but hopefully by the end of the day, you will be able to see how these names matter to us. And so we're going to talk about Enoch, but we'll get to him in a little bit. But if you remember last week, we talked about Cain and Abel, how Cain murdered his brother immediately after a worship service. They were worshiping God. They were um, offering sacrifices to God. They walk out, and Cain then goes and kills his brother and murders him. And the rest of Genesis 4 is the story about the descendants of Cain. It talks about the children of Cain and how they lived um, and who they were. Um, And if you read Genesis 4 when you get um, some time, we find out that Cain has a descendant by the name of Lamech. We'll hear about another Lamech this morning, but Cain had a great, great, great grandson by the name of Lamech. And Lamech, Cain's descendant, murders people as well. Cain happened to fall in a spur of a moment, kills his brother. But Lamech, his descendant, actually kills people and then brags about it, boasts about it. He follows in the footsteps of his forefather Cain and lives a life of rebellion against God. But God wasn't done with Adam and Eve. When, after Cain was murdered, um, Abel was murdered, Adam and Eve had another child, a child by the name of Seth. The last verse in Genesis 4 says that Seth gives birth to a son, and afterward, immediately, the people begin to call on the name of God again. And what we have in Genesis 5, our text this morning, is a genealogy of Adam's descendants all the way through Noah, from the creation of man all the way to the flood. Now, let me confess to you, I have never done a message on genealogies before, and there's a reason for that. Genealogies are boring. There is nothing fascinating about the names of people and knowing that this guy gave birth to this son and then that son gave birth to another son and they lived this many years. There's nothing fascinating in there. And if you read Genesis 5, you'll find that these names of these people are unpronounceable and this list seems endless. You know I'm telling you the truth. How many times... Did you begin in January 1, say, I'm going to read the entire Bible this year, and you get to like Genesis 4 or 5, and you're like, yeah, I'm done for right now, right? Because these names are confusing, and you have no idea what, what they mean and what, why they're relevant to us. But in preparing this week, I realized that we simply can't dismiss genealogy so quickly. We simply can't dismiss lists so quickly. After all, many of us that will call these names borings are the same people that have our apps open looking at our fantasy football players to see how many touchdowns they scored and how many points we made and whether our team will beat the other team. And Doom, you are going down today, just to let you know. Um, But that is what we do. If the list is interesting to us, we get excited about it, right? The truth is, the list is only boring if it doesn't apply to you. Think about how much money is spent annually on people trying to find out who their forefathers were, who trying to figure out their family tree. A genealogy will be important at certain times in your life when a will is being read. It matters a lot whether your name is on that will or not, right? So Genesis 5, this is a genealogy of 10 men. It starts with Adam, goes all the way to Noah. And this this genealogy covers about 1,600 years. It goes from creation to the flood. And interestingly enough, it is a list of 10 men who lived a life of faith in an increasing unbelief, in a world of unbelief, in a world that was openly rejecting God. 
So when you read Genesis 5 and when you read these names, these are giants of our faith, men who refuse to follow the ways of the world and re refuse to conform and reject God, but followed God even when everyone else was rejecting God. Not only were these men faithful to God, the truth of the matter was God was faithful to them. He records their names in Scripture. There will always be people that will serve God. See, no matter how many bow down their knee to Baal or to other gods or reject God, God never leaves himself without a witness. And even though believers may be in a minority at certain times and certain places around the world, he always rewards them in his own time and in his own way. God remembers when you are faithful. God remembers when you are living for him, and he will reward you in his own time and his own way. In the midst of ungodliness, these men chose to be godly. In the midst of wickedness, these men chose to be good. In the midst of rebellion, these men chose to be righteous. In the midst of bitterness, these men were blessed. Now, I'll admit, there are some incredible challenges when you read this text. What do we make of the lifespan of Methuselah, who lived 969 years? Um, middle age for him was like 475 years. Midlife crisis begins around 575 when he goes out and buys a brand new golden chariot and a big red robe and begins to drive around the city. There's some things that we can't answer in here. There's Adam, who decides to give birth to a child at the age of 130. We had our third when I was in my mid-30s, and I get exhausted chasing him around every week. And Adam, at the age of 130, turns to Eve and says, hey, why don't we do this one more time? Let's go have another baby go through diapers and feedings and lack of sleep the entire night. There's quite a bit of challenges in this story, and I'll tell you that I don't have the answers for a lot of questions that we have. Verse 4 says that Adam and Eve had many other sons and daughters. We're not told how many they have. We're just told that he had other kids. And that doesn't answer a lot of technical questions for us. Questions about incest or children sleeping together and how they began to multiply and if what happens in Arkansas is still legal or whatnot, you know? It doesn't answer those questions, but I don't know the answers to these questions. But I can see that this is a very unique period of time for us. And if you're from Arkansas, forgive me. Uh, no offense. I want to point four things out from our text this morning. Four things that our scriptures teach us this morning. Number one is the value of every individual to God. The value of every individual to God. I said this earlier, but biblical genealogies can be boring. You've got to ask the question, though, why are they there? Why does God take the time to write down the names of these people? Why are these unpronounceable names in Scripture? See, it's important to note that these people are real people with real names who lived in a real time, space, and history in real places around the world. See, this serves to remind us that every single human individual that has been born and created in the image of God has intrinsic value and worth to God. He made the effort to preserve all of these names for us through all of these centuries to make sure that we knew that these people who had names were valuable to God. Guys like Jared, not from Subway, but Jared in Scripture, um, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech. These guys mattered to God. These guys were valuable to God. See, these guys, their names are insignificant to you and I. We don't care for them. We don't know anything about who they are or what they did. We don't know if they made a difference in the, in the world that they lived in. Their details about their lives are completely hidden from us, but this much we know. Their lives matter to God, and God knew them by name. God knew them by name. These names are not just names written on a piece of paper to represent men who walked the earth hundreds of years ago. These are people that were valued by God. Listen, that means your name. That means you as a person. You're important to God as well. 
you are valued and loved by God. He knows you. He values you. He loves you. You're not a label to him. You're not someone that just happens to be born. Scripture says he knew you before you were even born. He loves you. It means your spouse, if you are married, has value and worth. It means your neighbor, your weird uncle, your annoying coworker, all of them have intrinsic value and worth to God. It means that people of a different skin color from you have intrinsic value and worth to God. It also means that the person that you hate the most in the world, the one that annoys you the most, that person has intrinsic value and worth to God. It means those who cannot defend themselves and fight for their own rights have intrinsic value and worth to God. It means that little children who are being aborted on a daily basis have intrinsic value and worth to God. It means that children who grow up on the streets without moms and dads have intrinsic value and worth to God. It means that every single parent that is struggling trying to make sure their kids are okay, listen, they have intrinsic worth and value to God. It means the elderly who cannot take care of themselves and feel isolated and alone at times, they have intrinsic value and worth to God. It means that every undocumented person that's living in our city has intrinsic value and worth to God. It means in the eyes of God, black lives matter, white life matters, Asian life matters, Hispanic lives matter, Latino lives matter, African lives matter, the upper class matters, the middle class matters, lowercase class matters, everyone matters. The life of Christians have value and worth to God, so does the life of Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and Jews and atheists and people that want to be associated with no religion of all. Every single person that has a name that has been given birth in this world matters to God. Their lives of intrinsic value and worth from the womb to the tomb, every human being is valuable to God. Every human be being has value and worth. See, we get reminded of that when we read passages like this of unpronounceable names, that these names mattered to God. These individuals mattered to God. And you might sit here and say, I don't bring anything to the table. I might not do much for God. I'm just simply going through the routines of work and doing the things I do. But listen, your life matters to God. You are valued. You are loved. You belong to him. He doesn't just call you by a label. He calls you son. He calls you daughter. He calls you by name. You're valued. Number two, this text reminds us of the importance of passing on a spiritual heritage. The importance of passing on a spiritual heritage. Mentioned earlier in Genesis 4, we read about the descendants of Cain, the man who rebelled against God, a man who rejected God and his grace. His descendants rejected God to the point that by the time we get to Lamech, he starts exulting in the fact that he murdered people. Lamech basically said that if anyone bothers me, I'm going to kill him. Cain caved in when he killed Abel. But Lamech is exalting in the fact that he murders people. Sin compounds, and that bad spiritual heritage is passed on from generation to generation. The children followed the example of their parents. But when we get to Genesis 5, we begin to read the story of Seth. The whole direction in the line of Seth is completely opposite of the line of Cain. We read in the last verse of chapter 4 that the people were now calling on the name of God when Seth were born, when Seth was born. See, it's beautiful to see what can happen when people care about their heritage, what they want to pass on to people around them. See, that's a great question for all of us to ask in this room. Whether you are a parent or not, if you are a parent, it's a great question for you to ask, what are you passing on to your children? But it's an important question for all of us because the fact of the matter is, it is entirely possible that you might be the best Christian that someone might see in their lives. You might be the best example of Jesus that your coworker might see. And how you live your life is passed on to them. 
whether it points people toward Jesus or it points people away from Jesus. How you live your life matters. See, what important for us as Christians is not to show people how perfect we are or how right we got it or how what our political agendas are because we can't show people we're perfect because we're not. What's important for them to see in us is that how we really throw ourselves 100% dependent on the grace and mercy of God on a daily basis for our salvation and for us to daily live our lives for God. Elton Truewood True Blood made a quote in his book. He said, The company of Jesus is not people streaming to a shrine, and it's not people making up an audience for a speaker. It is laborers engaged in the harvesting task of reaching their perplexed and seeking brethren with something so vital that if it is received, it will change their lives. It's not about living perfect lives. It's the amazing mystery of the gospel that Jesus has paid the price for our sins, that he has paid the price for our salvation, and that we can simply lift up our empty hands and receive the gift of salvation, something that we can't earn on our own at all. See, what are people seeing in us when we think about our spiritual heritage? See, if you're unsure... Don't be offended, but maybe it's because God's not visible in your life. Maybe it's because you're not letting God shine through your life. What her spiritual heritage are you passing on? It's either one or the other. You're either pointing people toward God or you're pointing people away from God. There was a report, a study that was done on the life of two people that lived in the 1800s or in the 1700s. In 1877, when visiting the prisons of New York, Richard Dugdale found inmates with 42 different last names, all descending from one man, a man called Max Jukes. He was born in 1720 from Dutch descent, uh, immigrants. He was an atheist. He wanted nothing to do with God. and In fact, he waved his hand at God and hated people who followed God. He was a hard drinker. He was irreverent toward people of God. He was uneducated, and he mocked people of faith and shook his fist at God. And they did a study of his life and his descendants, and this is what they discovered. Of the descendants of Max Jukes, his lineage included seven murderers, 60 thieves, 50 women that ended up in prostitution, 130 other convicts, 310 paupers who basically spent 2,300 years in homeless shelters, and 400 physically wrecked by indulgent living, drunk, and they just destroyed their lives. And the study said that the Jukes family and his descendants cost the state of New York $1.25 million. This is in 1877. During the same time, there was another man who was born who loved God with his life. This man entered Yale College at the age of 13, he graduated with honors. He became a pastor, and his sermon, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God, started the Great Awakening, a revival that involved numerous preachers which swept America, uniting the colonies prior to the Revolution. The man's name was a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards, born in 1703. Jonathan Edwards, at a young age, resolved, he said, never to do anything which I would be afraid to do if it was my last hours of my life. And they did a study on the descendants of Jonathan Edwards. And here's what they discovered. From his lineage came one U.S. vice president, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 65 professors, 80 politicians, public office holders, 100 lawyers, 100 missionaries. Listen, your heritage matters. What you pass on matters. How you live your life matters. Not just for you, but for the people that are around you. And maybe this morning you come from a home that had a bad spiritual heritage. Can I say thank goodness we serve a God who makes all things new. 
and that he can take your life and he can take your story and he can create something brand new with it. I'm just glad he doesn't yell and scream like he used to when he gets up here. Um, he can take your story today and he can make it brand new. Your past doesn't have to define you. What happened in your family up to this point doesn't have to define you. The God of grace and mercy can take your story and create something brand new with it. But what you pass on to the future matters. How you live your life on college, in, on your college campus matters. How you do your work matters. What, how you raise your children matter. You're either pointing people toward Jesus or you're pointing people away from Jesus. Live your life in such a way that people see God through your life. The third thing I want to point out in this text is the reality of our, moral, our mortality. Eight times in our text we're told, and he died. Adam died. Seth died. Enosh died. Kenan died. Mahalalel died. Jared died. Methuselah died. Lamech died. The only person that didn't die was a man by the name of Enoch. Even Noah, Genesis 6 says, he died. There's a drumbeat of death in this chapter that echoes across every generation, even to our generation. But because of what happened with Enoch, God gives a standing pledge of death's defeat. This is why the message of the Bible, the message of the gospel is good news. God in Jesus has defeated the power and the permanence of death in our lives. It says that Enoch walked with God and he was not. God took him. He didn't have to taste death. We're told in Hebrews 11 that he has this amazing testimony that was pleasing to God that he didn't have to die. We're told in the book of Jude that Enoch was a prophet of God that would call out the sins in the culture that he lived in. He was a man that was on fire for God. He lived his life on passionate fire for God. It said twice in our text this morning that Enoch walked with God. See, Enoch, in a sense, is foreshadowing Jesus. Christ would ultimately come and dismantle the permanence of death. He would live a life in such a way that he would defeat death on the cross. Therefore, you and I don't have to fear and worry about dying. We don't have to worry whether we will, what will happen to us if something happens to our bodies. Enoch points us to Jesus. Henry Nowen, in his book, Seeds of Hope, wrote this. He said, when we live in communion with God, when we belong to God's household, there is no longer any before or after. Death is no longer the dividing line. Death has lost its power over those who belong to God because God is the God of the living, not of the dead. Once we have tasted the joy and the peace that comes from being embraced by God's love, we know that all is well and all will be well. Don't be afraid, Jesus says. I have overcome the powers of death. Come and dwell with me and know that where I am, there your God is as well. Number four, the relational aspect of spirituality. Let's go back to the story of Enoch for a second. The Bible says he walked with God. In the entire Bible, it's only said of two people that they walked with God. It was about Enoch, and it was about Noah, who we'll look at next week. I said earlier, Enoch was a prophet. We know that God took him before he died. He never tasted death. But what do we make of that statement that he walked with God? What does that metaphor imply? What does it mean to walk with God? See, walking can be defined as a series of small steps in the same direction over a long period of time. In Enoch's case, he began to walk with God after the birth of his son. Perhaps, he's like many of us guys that realize that, oh my gosh, we have the responsibility of this baby, and we're just not equipped, and we run to God and ask God for help. That's maybe what happened with Enoch. But he begins to walk with God the moment his son was born. And the Bible says he walked with God for 300 years of his life. See, walking implies a number of things. Number one, you have to be in the same place at the same time. 
If I'm on Arapaho Road going in one direction and you're on Custer going in the other direction, we're both walking, but we're not walking together. If I'm at our destination at 2.45, but you only get there at 7.45, we both might have been walking, but we're not walking together. It implies that you're walking at the same time, in the same direction, in the same place. Second, you have to be going in the same direction. If I go east and you go west, we might both be walking, but we're not walking together. Third, we have to be going at the same pace. If I speed walk and you're just strolling along, we might both have a good time walking, but we're not going to be walking together. And listen, when I said that, I probably hit on something that probably frustrates a lot of us when it comes to God. Because for a lot of us, it frustrates us that God doesn't go at the pace that we want him to go on. Sometimes it's, God, could you hurry this up a little bit? Could you move a little bit? Could you, come on, just change my situation around a little faster? Could you answer this prayer a little faster? God, you aren't moving fast enough for me. Sometimes we want God to move at a much faster pace then he's moving. We want answers, and we want answers now. We're tired of being in the same situation, asking for the same requests, and God doesn't seem to answer us. We're tired of driving through the same potholes, facing the same obstacles that are in front of us, all of us, all the time, and we want God to change the circumstances for us, but God doesn't do that sometimes. But you know, the opposite is true also. Sometimes we want God to kind of, hey, let us be. We're enjoying this season of our lives. We like where we are. We're comfortable. Things are going well, and all of a sudden God says, no, we're going to move. We're going to keep moving, and if you want to stay with me, if you want to walk with me, you're going to have to get up, and you're going to have to start walking. If you want to walk together when I'm moving, you need to be moving. Because even if you like where you are, that is not your final destination for you. I've got something better planned for you, and I can't let you get comfortable where you're at. See, all of us face that struggle, don't we? We want, sometimes we just want God to move a lot faster than he's moving, and he doesn't. And we wonder, God, why don't you move? Why don't you answer? And there are other times in our life we wish God would just leave things the way we are because we like it, and God comes in and shakes things up a little bit. Why does he do that? Because... He sees the destination much more clear than we do. Sometimes he makes us wait because he knows that waiting is good for us. Sometimes he makes us go because he knows that if we get comfortable, we'll never accomplish the things that he has for our life. See, you, you can choose to sit and stay where you're at, or you can choose to walk with God. And when you walk with God, God can do great and mighty things through your life. Walking together implies a shared commitment to be at the same place at the same time, going in the same direction together. For Enoch to walk with God, it meant every morning he woke up and said, God, where do you want to go today? And wherever God went, Enoch went. He set his heart to walk with God by his side, in the same direction, at the same pace, all day long, every day. And he did this day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, because his heart was set to follow God no matter what. And he walked with God, and it became a habit for his life. Eventually, he didn't have to wake up and say, God, where are we going? Am, am I going to walk with God? He just got up and began to follow God wherever God took him. See, the decision was made a long time before, and he simply continued to follow in the direction because he chose to follow God no matter what. See, we often have trouble with this because we say, God, let's go right or let's go left. And God says, yeah, you think so? And we go off together, and then God, as soon as we get started, the go God goes in the opposite direction. And suddenly, he begins to turn left and turn right, and then he stops, and then... We circle the block, and then God leads us in a brand new direction altogether, something that we didn't think that, or somewhere we didn't think God was going to take us. And with each turn, we have to decide whether we're going to follow our own inclinations and our own desires, or are we going to put ourselves, are we going to 
put ourselves to the side and simply follow God and let him lead us moment by moment, step by step, wherever he wants us to go. See, that's what it means to follow God. He leads, we follow. Any other plan in your life is bound to, fall, bound to fail. The destination is one that you share with God. Let me be honest. This metaphor, it unmasks the deceit in my own heart often. I'll admit that there are days that I don't want to make time for God. There are days where I don't make time to be with God, which means that I don't want to be around God. The devil didn't make me do it. I just didn't want to do it. I just didn't make it a priority. See, that's the way we are. And it's good for us to admit that and pray and ask God to give us the want to even when we don't want to. Sometimes I don't want to take the route that God is calling me to take. I look ahead and I see obstacles and challenges and I'm like, God, I don't want to go that route. I don't want to go in that direction. Sometimes I don't like the speed in which God is traveling. Sometimes I just want God to slow down or sometimes I just want him to speed up. But sometimes I don't like the speed in which he's going. See, if God's destiny is for us to become into the image of Jesus, to remove sin from our lives and to fill us and make us more like Jesus, sometimes, can I admit, I don't like that process as well. Because there are things in my life that I like, but I know God doesn't like it, but it's a struggle for me to let go of those things. But I know that if I want to become like Jesus, that the process is hard, but in the end, it's worth it. But in the end, he will make me like Jesus, and it will be worth it. See, sometimes I don't like the discipline that it requires to be able to walk with God on a continued basis. See, it's part of the disposition of our heart that it's here where grace and mercy has to apply. And they have to apply to our rebellious hearts and minds as we surrender to him. And when we do, God gives us a new heart and a new mind. We begin to see things as God sees it. We begin to think, want things that God wants. Our wanter, our desire machine that's inside of us is broken, but God begins to heal it. The transforming power of the Holy Spirit can do amazing things with anyone who is willing to simply lift up empty hands and cry out to God for help. This is how we come into a right relationship with God, admitting our need and asking Him for help. See, we can't do this on our own goodness. We need God's grace and God's mercy that's only found in Jesus. See, one day Enoch and God was walking so far along that God just said, hey, today, why don't you just, instead of turning back and going home, why don't you just come home with me? And Enoch walked beyond space and time into eternity. The Bible says he was not because God took him off the earth and allowed him to enter heaven without experiencing the pain of death. See, this is a reminder that death doesn't have the last word in the life of believers. One day, the Bible says, death himself shall be destroyed once and for all. See, what a blessing it was for the children of Enoch to be able to say their father walked with faith, walked with God to the point that God just said, come on home. He walked with God in an ungodly age. Jude reminds us that Enoch was a preacher of righteousness who declared the truth of God to an ungodly generation. See, he walked with God in an immoral culture, and listen, so can we. We don't have to conform. We can live for Jesus where God has placed us. See, maybe this morning you're walking in the wrong direction, and you need to get right with God. What do you need to do? It's unbelievable how simple this is. You confess your sins. 
you repent, meaning you turn around and go in the opposite direction. Listen, if you're going in the wrong direction, it's a bad thing to continue to progressing in that direction. You will continue to get lost. So when you repent, you turn. You begin to get back on the right road. Progress means that you turn around, you go back and you follow Jesus and you believe that God will do his part. He says, we read this this morning, that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive you. He will be faithful to do his part, to wash away your sins, to forgive you. Then you follow Jesus. See, that's what Christians are. We're not perfectionists. We don't have our act together. We're followers of Jesus. We're Christ followers. We're daily trusting God to make us more and more like them. And it's not a one-time event that happens. You don't just confess one time. You follow him daily. And let's be honest, at least for me, that whole repentance and confession and turning around, that's a daily thing for me as well because I don't have my act together. It's a daily thing of saying, God, I screwed up today. I didn't pursue you the way I should have pursued you. I didn't walk with you today. Help. Help me. Help me follow you. There are things in my life, God, that I enjoy, but they're not doing any good things for me. Help me to follow you. God, there are places I'm going or things I'm doing or people I'm hanging out with that are pulling me away from you instead of close to you. Help me to walk with you. I want to sit here and enjoy where I'm at, but God, you're all the way up there and I'm not following you. Help me to follow you. God, I'm pushing you to make you move faster and you're waiting because you know this is a good season for me to be here because I can grow, but I want to rush you. Help me to follow you. Help me to walk with you day in, day out. You know, one of those things I love about Genesis 5, these men, 10 men, the only man, only man in this story that does something fascinating for God is a man by Noah. He builds an ark and he survives. The other nine, there's nothing fascinating about their lives. They don't do crazy miracles. They don't turn water into blood. They don't um, split a sea open. None of that stuff. They got up every morning they went to work, took care of their family, pointed their children toward Jesus, pointed their spouses toward Jesus, did their jobs in such a way that people saw Jesus. That's all they did. These men, they're you, they're me. We might never do crazy things for Jesus. It doesn't negate the fact that your life matters. What you do matter. How you live your life matters. Some of you in this room work with kids. How you live your life matters because they're watching you. Some of you are in offices and you might be the only believer there. Your life matters because they're watching you. Some of you are students and you've got roommates and they're watching you. Your life matters. Some of you are parents. Your kids are watching you. Your life matters. Some of you are married. Your spouses are watching you. Your life matters. What kind of heritage are you leaving? What kind of story are you leaving behind? How are you living your life for Jesus? Because there will come a day 60, 70, 80, 90 years from now, whenever God decides to call you home, that when you walked with God, you will receive the greatest blessing you'll ever receive. You will stand before your Creator and He will say, Well done. Well done. And you know, no matter how much wealth you amass on this earth, it compares nothing to hearing those words from your Creator. Well done. How you live your life matters. The story of Enoch and the story of these ten men, men that we don't know anything about, remind us every single second, 
every single day. What we do and how we do it matters to God. It reminds us that you matter to God, that you are valuable, that you are loved, that he cares for you. It reminds us that we're here only for a season. We're not immortal. We're not. A lot of us in this room are young. We're not thinking about that. But this story reminds us we only have a short span on this earth. And what you do in that short span matters. And it reminds us that we serve a God who is incredibly gracious. That those days when we don't want to walk with God, he doesn't make us do a million different things to get us back right with God. He simply says, get back up, repent, join me. Let's do this together. The greatest evidence of the graciousness and the mercy of God that we get to celebrate on a weekly basis is this table. This table reminds us that when we were the worst of sinners, even today when we screw up and mess up, this table reminds us that God didn't love us based on how well we performed. This table reminds us that while we were sinners, while we are sinners, Christ died for us. Christ loved us. So I'm going to invite you this morning to examine your heart. Maybe this morning you need to remind yourself that you are incredibly loved and valued by the creator of the universe, that he knows your name, that he loves you, that this table is a reminder that he died for you. Maybe you need to be reminded that, yes, you belong to God, but how you live your life matters to God. Maybe you need to be reminded that there is grace and forgiveness for when you fall. So I'm going to let you spend some time before God, just you and yourself. And whenever you're ready this morning, Thank you.